first up is Tom Young, Thomas Young. He's actually Thomas Elliot Young. Uh, we confuse ourselves on occasion. Uh, a good friend, uh, one of the pioneers of crowdfunding in New Hampshire for sure and in the country. I mean, he's got a great story. He's going to do crowdfunding 101. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on now. <laughs> it's these earphones that I just got. I just can't take them off. They sound so good. You're going to learn a little bit more about these. Okay, my name is Thomas Young, and uh, I guess I'm the opening act. Um, uh, I'm going to do basically crowdfunding 101 for everybody. And I have 35 minutes to do so. I'm going to try and pack in a lot of information. But just to give me <clears throat> a little bit of guidance, um, we have a large, diverse crowd here. I'm curious, just to a couple questions for you. How many people here, um, you probably all have a pretty good idea what crowdfunding is. How many people here have come because they're thinking of doing this? And when I say crowdfunding, crowdfunding something to either you know make a project, make a, a DVD, or to start a company. Actually, you want, you'd like to crowdfund the next two or three months. Okay. I'm a, a, certainly a third or so. Um, the second question is, and what's exciting about this is, you're going to learn quite a bit about equity crowdfunding, which is the hot thing coming up. That, well, it's already law, um, uh, HR Bill 3606. It will become reality early next year, and that's going to be pretty pretty wild stuff. How many people have come here to hear about that? Okay, so about the same. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm the fellow that crowdfunds. Um, I've also been doing this for a while and writing about it, and I have a bit of knowledge about the equity, but we have some real equity people here. Uh, Matt uh, Benson, who just spoke, and, um, and uh, Mike Norman, who's going to be Skyping in with us. These are the fellows that are on the cutting edge of, uh, of uh, equity crowdfunding. So <clears throat> let's start off with a few definitions. Uh, next slide. This is probably, unless you study this stuff, which uh, I've just finished working, uh, writing a book, so I had to learn all this stuff. I had to really learn all this stuff. Um, crowdfunding can be broken up into four different areas, and this is kind of important. Um, when you learn about this and when you read about it, you're going to find that the, these, are, these are kind of the terms that are used, but um, I, believe, I believe Mike Norman... Uh, or I had seen at some point, instead of equity-based crowdfunding, they were talking about crowd investing. The point I'm trying to make is these are the terms that are you know, being used maybe 80% of the time, but this stuff is all cutting edge and, and bit different. You know, People write about it and say different things. I'm going to lay it in this groundwork because I think this is the easiest to teach. Okay, number one, crowdsourcing. Um, let me explain what crowdsourcing is all about. It's, it's actually pretty simple. It's a whole group of people getting together to do something. If we all got together and raised a barn, I mean, that's kind of crowdsourcing. It's not exactly the old stuff. Crowdsourcing, of course, has become much easier with the internet because you can get groups of people to do things over the internet. Information, data kind of things. Let's suppose all of us want to design Durham's finest t-shirt, the best t-shirt that's ever been made in Durham. All of us are going to get together, and we're going to go someplace, hopefully with a lot of beverages, and we're going to sit down and come up with designs for t-shirts. And then we're all going to look at all those designs and vote on them, and then come up, the group is going to come up with the best t-shirt for Durham. That's crowdsourcing. That's a group of people working together, coming up with what would be, you know, Durham's best t-shirt. Now, that particular example, does that ring a bell with anybody? Like this uh, Close. Close. There's a company out there called Threadless. Anybody heard of Threadless? That's their business model. They have, if you think this is kind of a small little niche kind of thing, uh, Threadless started four years ago. 
They have a community of I don't know how many hundreds of thousands, it's millions I suspect. Every week they have a t-shirt competition. Everybody submits the t-shirts. They make the, the winners, which I think they choose two per week, and then everybody who's involved, a, a, a very large proportion of them buy the t-shirts. Think about that. It's a community that just self-generates and everybody buys in. Last time I checked, they are a $80 million company. So crowdsourcing has the potential of doing some pretty wild things. That's just t-shirts. There's places out there that do um, scientific things and so on and so forth. Um, there is no reason for anybody, I'm sorry if there's any graphic designers out there, uh, to go and spend uh, huge dollars for a lot of your creative. If you want a logo for $100, there's quite a number of companies out there. I've seen some of the logos that have come out of there, and I do some logo work myself, and I'm just amazed. <laughs> Same thing, people come in with logos, you get to choose what you want. So crowdsourcing. Um, by the way, the term was uh, was uh, coined in 2006 in Wired Magazine by a guy named, by the name of Jeff Howe. His name is everywhere now when you talk about crowdsourcing. Okay, I'm spending too much time on crowdsourcing. If everybody in the room starts giving me money for something, or giving money to something, now we're talking about crowdfunding. Okay, crowdsourcing was helping out. I like that t-shirt. Crowdfunding is, I'm going to give $20 to you for something. Now, see we have four different groups here. Let's go through them. Donation-based crowdfunding. NPR. It's fundraising. Right? It's been around quite a while. Um, when the kid comes to your door saying, I'm from the New Hampshire, you know, uh, conservation, water conservation, you know, would you like the, you know, information and then donate, that's... That is donation-based, you know, that's fundraising, the UNH Foundation fundraising. Next one, debt-based crowdfunding. This one's a little bit more obscure. I'm gonna bet only a few people have heard about this. There are websites that basically take the crowd and act, we're all now a bank. And we get together and we look at, let's say, instead of choosing t-shirts, we look at like five different people that need money. You know, we have a farmer in Wisconsin that needs some sort of barrel to just, you know, to pasteurize his milk. Do we want to put money into that fellow and then and then get a return on it? That's called debt-based crowdfunding. It's not that popular. Um, there was a there's a website out there called Prosper that was doing this in a very big way, and they were actually doing well. And then, boom, they got hit by the recession. A lot of people defaulted, and so it's taken on sort of a, you know, it's not nearly as popular. Um, the whole point there is disintermediation of banks. And it's probably not a bad idea. It's, it's just, it's happening slowly now with, you know, with the credit issues and that, a lot of defaults. Okay. Reward-based crowdfunding. Has anybody not heard of Kickstarter? Everybody knows Kickstarter, right? They're the emblematic company for, for crowdfunding. That is reward-based crowdfunding. And, and this is kind of important because I'm telling you folks, I've lived this now for a year and a half, so I can tell you from being on the cutting edge of this stuff or, or in the trenches. Uh, reward-based crowdfunding, if you've been to Kickstarter, I'll give you an example that's not mine, but there's a lot of people doing films, DVDs, books, and that sort of thing. What you're doing is you're giving money to a filmmaker to, re to realize their vision. And some of these visions are pretty cool. And what they're saying is, you give me this money, and if, and if we hit a certain level, I'm going to go out and shoot my DVD, my documentary, about you know poverty in some area of the world, and you give me twenty-five dollars, and you're going to get a copy of that DVD. And if you think about that, that's a pretty cool business model. And that filmmaker, who by the way has just graduated from you know film school or so on and so forth, would never get that financing any other way, unless they have rich uncles. <laughs> and once you get beyond family and friends, there's nothing for that kind of unproven kind of entrepreneur. 
And reward-based crowdfunding is Kickstarter, Indiegogo, uh, Rocket Hub, and all those others. You give the creative individual money, and they give you something out of that. Like um, the Pebble Watch, right? Which was just an amazing one. That one put, I mean, if there isn't, if, if some, uh, the, it used to be, uh, uh, they're all watches, by the way. Uh, the, the first one was the TikTok watch. That one raised just shy of a million. And the Pebble watch, they had to shut down the campaign when it hit 10 million. $10 million came into that campaign. And that's for a new kind of watch that basically Bluetooth from your phone to the watch. So you can raise an awful lot of money by doing this. And I've done some, and I'll explain in just a little bit. Now, I, I hope this isn't all becoming a mess for you. I know it's kind of a lot of term. You know, in my mind, I look at this all the time, and I, you know, it's just this kind of thing. Equity-based crowdfunding is selling shares. Think about, um, uh, you know, basically buying stocks. If you're a little company, the filmmaker, I'll tell you what, I've got this great idea for a film. It's about poverty and, uh, you know, New Guinea, which there's a lot. And um, I would like to do something, um, and I'd like to sell shares in this. Well, that's maybe not the sort of thing that people are going to put money into to buy part of your company. But I can tell you that there's no other way other than using one of the others for them to raise money. Suppose I want to build, um, I'm a bakery, I have eight locations, I want to open up my, my, my flagship location. Um, what was the business that was right out here? Um, the chicken business. Anyway, they recently moved and they have a big, huge location. Uh, that's on Route 1, the Lafayette Road. Um, anyway, that, that, caught, that was loaned by a bank and so on. So that might be something that could be equity financed because he, he had a location here. One food was wonderful. And it was so wonderful, he, he left us, went somewhere else to bigger, you know, wider paradise, I guess. Um, and and, and that, that could have been equity crowdfunded if it were allowed. The problem is... It's not allowed just yet. I'm going to explain that in a few minutes. Okay, uh, next slide. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah. I want to explain. I got 35 minutes. So the debt based crowdfunding it sounds a little like angel investing. It is. It is, basically. Okay. Um, and are there uh, minimum, maximum? Is that regulated? Not really. Okay. Not really. It's uh, the debt based crowdfunding. There's, there's only a few places that are really doing it, and it's uh, and every one of them is fairly different from the other. It's a little bit uncharted, the, the, the debt base. Okay. I think that with, when the, equi the equity stuff that happens next year is just going to, it's going to be everywhere and all the business media for so long. I think it's going to kind of lift all the, you know, the boats to some degree. You'll see more of that. So. Can I just clarify one thing? Uh, debt, the selling of a promissory note in connection with debt, does have securities implications. If I don't want to take your time, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, during my quick 20 minutes. You get a whole 35. But, <laughs> right. uh, um, but anyway, so we'll, we can get into that too, and I can take questions about some of that when we get there. But equity is broader than just stock, so you do have to be careful. Yep, exactly. And what I'm going to do, by the way, Matt, what I'm going to do is, at least I, I was going to chat with you about this beforehand. Um, I was going to do a little bit about the equity just to give the history of it yeah. and then I'll lead it into you. Exactly what I Okay, said. great. Yep. Um, okay, let me, let me show you what I did. Um, this, um, this is a pile of broken earbuds I pulled out of my son's room when he came to me and said, this is about a year and a half ago. Uh, it, by the way, my background, uh, electrical engineer, most of it audio equipment. Audio, video, I worked at a number of companies. So uh, working with this sort of stuff is, yeah, I've got a number of years' experience, quite a number of decades' of experience. So my son comes to me, and he says, Dad, you know, hey, uh, can you get me some earbuds? You're going, you know, into, uh, into town. I just got a set of earbuds, didn't I, two weeks ago? Yeah, but they're broken. Okay, how'd they break? I don't know. Um, now, I also like to repair things. I'm one of those people that 
people that just loves to fix things, but it, it usually when it's simple and I love saving money. Elliot, how many of these earbuds do you have? It seems to me I've bought like 10 of them in the last year. And he said, well, well they're all in my room. He brings me in this nest of buds, and uh, you know, it's one of those moments they show you on TV where the bulb goes off, you know, the wily coyote things. <laughs> I'm looking at this going, what's wrong with this? Okay, um, can any of these, some of them you can see the things that come off of them and stuff like that. Can, can any of these be fixed so I don't have to go buy? Now you can get this kind of cheap earbud now for about five bucks, but back then they were like 20. Can I fix this with a soldering iron? Anyway, I'm thinking about this and I'm going, there's got to be a better way. Why are we throwing out all this stuff? Why is it breaking all the time? Um, my daughter's no different. Hers break all the time too. Oh, don't get me going on on gaming gear, you know? Um, the headsets on those things, do, do they, I think they design, uh, now keep in mind, let me just tell you, you know, I, I'm an engineer, so I deal with this stuff. In engineering school, and I went to UNH, there certainly wasn't any class on learning planned obsolescence. There's, you know, if you hear people talking about that, you know, especially in relation to they, you hear this with the automotive industry. They, they never teach engineers that. This is kind of a, a side effect of they do talk capital. About I, I, I had an engineering professor who touched on this. Yeah, did, did he talk about it being, or he talked about it being uh, no, something it, that it, occurs. They did, they because, did purposefully, yeah. They, oh, really? Interesting. That's the first I've heard of that. I look at it as a byproduct of capitalism. Look, folks, if you're going to be selling earbuds, there's, you know, there's only so much profit in these things. Now, if you make a product repairable, that means when it breaks, somebody has to do something about it in your company. The stats are, think Dell. If you have a United States-based customer service rep, every one of the phone calls that comes into your your call center is about seven bucks. If you go to India, offshore and so on, they're about half of that. If you do it on the web, it's about half of that. The point I'm trying to make is, wait a minute, seven bucks? There's not even that kind of margin in these things. So there's, you know, if there's not a real drive to say, you know, we want to be green and, and make this repairable and so on. It's not, it's not exactly a great business model. But of course, I'm just me looking at it going, maybe this is a niche business model. So, next slide. I put them up on Kickstarter. Real simple plea there. I'm sick and tired of buying new earbuds. Um, next slide, please. I knew where to get these things built. I even had the, the factory arranged. Uh, they're, they're built in, in uh, Shenzhen. Now, th this is kind of another little side story, but you can spend a lot of time getting things built in China. There's communication issues and that kind of thing. I had it arranged, but there really was no product. These, this is an Adobe Illustrator drawing that I imported a bunch of Photoshop stuff into and said, this is my idea. Okay, this is what I've got in mind. Let's... Uh, Let's do this and make these things repairable for those that want to repair these things. And, you know, in my mind, are there many people that want to repair these things? Maybe because they're $5, I'm the only one on the face of the planet that cares. I don't know. I suspect there's more than that, but uh, this is what we did. So, I, if you go on, by the way, you go on Kickstarter now, you see all these polished videos and so on and so forth. No, this is, I did this a year and a half ago. Things were as simple as that. <laughs> you know, I drew my earbuds. Okay, next uh, frame, please. Um, okay, um, let me just skip to the book here. Uh, what happened was we were successful. Actually, go back if you would. It's, uh, one more slide. It's hard to see. Um, I, I wanted $11,000, and I got $61,000. So two things. Got it. Got it. That's a nice chunk of money to build earbuds. And my calculations were I only need eleven thousand, so that's pretty good. Number two, 
people said they want repairable earbuds. They voted with their dollars. That's kind of cool. So, boy, I think that defines a business. You can do that with this crowdfunding. If you've got some idea that maybe won't play somewhere else in the world or anywhere else in the world, it didn't cost me a penny to put this up here. And I found I got money and I got my concept proven. So that's kind of crowdfunding. 